All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, if this this presentation is going to be about single directory components, uh, if that's what you're expecting, you're in the right room. And if it's not what you were expecting, there are presentations in the other rooms adjacent to here. And you should check those out. Um, so single directory components. Before we, we get into that, my name's Joe. Um, I'm a member of the Twin Cities Drupal community. Um, I've come to these camps for a number of years now. Uh, I work for DrupalEyes.me and help produce Drupal training content. Uh, I've also been doing that for quite a while. Um, so that's a little bit about me. You can find me on uh, pretty much any Drupal community thing as EOJ the Brave, which is actually just Joe spelled backwards because a long time ago, I thought it was important to be anonymous on the internet, and it would be more anonymous <laughs> if my name was backwards, but also I needed a name that would like spark fear in the hearts of my enemies while I was playing Warcraft, <laughs> so, and it stuck, and now I wish I had just picked like Joe.Shindelar, but this is the way it works. Um, I first heard about single directory components when I attended a presentation by Matteo and Mike at DrupalCon at Pittsburgh back in, well, it must have been June. Um, and it was, uh, it was fascinating to me in part because I had literally never heard of it until I went to this presentation, which I feel like is rare in the Drupal world that things kind of come up that fast and you're like, whoa, wait, it's in core? Like, I've, I've never even heard these words before. Um, and I went to the presentation to thinking, well, I'll learn something new. This will be fun. And I was totally blown away with what I learned, uh, in part because I was like, this is so simple. And how did this not exist before? And what a great idea. Um, and I was really excited about it. And I got the opportunity to chat with uh, Mateo and Mike a bit more at DrupalCon about the work that they were doing and learn some from them. And also um, learn from them that there were a lot of other people involved in this effort. Um, as is often the case with things in Drupal, it's not just one or two people that make these things become part of core. So there are a lot of people that we can thank for this single directory components work. I also think this is important to recognize too, especially in my case where this was a thing that just kind of jumped out of nowhere. I hadn't heard of it before. But when I started digging into it more, it's a recognition of like, wait, this is a thing that people have been thinking about and iterating on for a long time. This didn't actually just come out of nowhere. What ended up in Drupal core and what we're going to talk about is the result of years worth of people trying to figure out how to make Drupal work with components or component-based design. Uh -huh. So that was cool. These are some, but not all, of the people that were involved in making this happen. I'm going to talk about a handful of things. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what are components, um, just kind of generically what are components, and then also very specifically what are single directory components as they relate to Drupal. Um, in that, I would also like to talk a bit about kind of why this is an important, um, why components are an important concept, uh, why people are thinking about and using them. I'm going to talk quite a bit about how to use the single directory components API in Drupal with some examples. And then um, I'm going to postulate a little bit on what I think the future of Drupal might look like with components as part of core. Um, and I may or may not be right, but we'll see. Um, so a little bit about what components are. Generically, outside of Drupal or any specific uh, application design framework, you can, I think components are this sort of mythical box of Legos that you can click together to build your user interface. Um, we see this all the time in, um, if you've ever used a SaaS software, there's a reason they all look like Bootstrap or Material UI, because uh, someone used that component library in order to compose a, a user interface. You also see it uh, on your phone or on your operating system, where a lot of the applications tend to look the same, because someone designed what that widget for selecting you know, the on-off widget should look like and allows you to reuse it in your own interface or to compose an interface out of reusable components or reusable UI elements. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, there are that people are using component systems to do this. Um, 
they're reusable. So you invent it once and you can use it on many different projects. Um, that reusability can, creates a consistent experience. Um, you know, we see this again on an iOS device. Like the toggle looks the same in every iOS application. And maybe that's annoying that they all look the same, but we all know what to do with it because it's the same every time you use it. And there's value in that. Um, some of the, from a technical perspective, some things to think about with components, uh, especially in this case, components generally are designed to be able to be nested. So again, you can compose your UI and you might have, for example, a card component that has buttons, which are also a component inside of the card. And these things are intended to be used together and sometimes stacked within one another in order to create that user interface. At the same time, Components are self-contained elements. Uh, a component should work by itself in isolation of any other component. So a button will be a button whether it's inside of a card or not. Um, from a, a, a more technical perspective, I think some of the things that are important about the concept of components is this uh, idea of isolation, where components get isolated from the rest of your application, um, but also from one another. And because of that, they are, um, in theory at least, easier to maintain and test. Um, you could think of it, if you are it, writing unit tests for something, it's easier to test that component and make sure that it works if you can do so by just testing that one single block and not having to worry about all the other pieces that are involved with it. Um, not always, but the hope is that your components are well documented. Um, and especially with regards to the inputs for the component and what the outcome of that will be. So if I specify, if I create a button and I input this text and set these values, I should expect this outcome. Um, I think especially in comparison to what you might be familiar with when creating Drupal themes and working with Twig template files. Um, the inputs are sort of documented uh, in that there's a comment often at the top of the Twig template file that says these are the variables that are available in this template file most of the time. But there's also potentially lots of other variables, and you're not entirely sure what they might be set to. And the only way to really figure it out is to turn on Twig debugging mode and dump the entire context of the template file, and then start looking at it and trying to figure out what the heck any of these variables mean. Um, the nice thing about a component system is that those inputs should be well documented. It should say, the input is a title, and it needs to be a string. Um, the, the other input is a color that you would like the button to be. And it can be one of these four values. And if it's anything else, it's not going to work. Um, and I think that makes them potentially easier to work with. Um, components, um, and, and one of the things that I, one of the goals here, I think, with components in Drupal is the ability to integrate um, your design elements for your application with other tooling. Um, some of the common ones that I've seen used are uh, applications like Storybook, which is really for development of components, um, or tools like Figma, um, Photoshop, whatever your design tools are. Um, the theory is that if you can create a component and you can define what, it, what its inputs are and what it looks like when it's used, you should also be able to replicate that in a bunch of different systems, like, for example, Figma, so someone could mock up a user interface in their design tool that looks exactly the same way that it's going to look when you eventually use that component in your application. Um, another thing I think about with components here, and again, as kind of as it relates to Drupal, is that um, they're they're really widely used already outside of the Drupal theming world. Um, this is especially true in JavaScript frameworks like React or Vue or Svelte. Most of these are, you know, they're essentially like a wrapper around the idea of components. Uh, I mean, that's what React is. It is a system for composing interfaces out of components. Um, it is a thing that people who build user interfaces are generally familiar with already. And so it makes sense for Drupal uh, themers, um, people building Drupal applications, to want to 
also have access to that tooling. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a little bit of like, I think part of the reason this happens in Drupal is because everyone else is doing it. Because it's a good idea, everyone else was doing it because it made sense. Drupal now wants to do this too because it makes sense, but I also think that it helps us to um, retain people, front-end developers working in the Drupal ecosystem. Um, I think, you know, there's in the last couple of years, there's been a really big drive towards decoupled Drupal sites, so building the front end of your Drupal site using a different tool, and I think a lot of that is driven by because the other tool uses components and Drupal doesn't, um, and so there was a lot of uh, impetus in the community to create a system to allow doing this within Drupal. Um, this has been explored in Drupal for quite a while. There were a bunch of different paths that people took to try to create component design systems within Drupal. Um, single directory components is the one that is currently in core, but there were a lot of other implementations of this leading up to what is in core currently. There was single file components. There were people trying to use twig front matter to create component systems. Um, and so while it might seem like this all happened really fast in Drupal, it's actually been iterated on for quite a while. The benefit of it being coming up with a solution and putting it into core is that now the community can kind of coalesce around a single way of solving this problem, which I think means that, uh, one, it becomes available to more people to use, and two, we'll see tighter integration with Drupal and all of the other uh, Drupal tools, layout builder and views and panels and that kind of stuff. Um, so single directory components is Drupal's implementation of this idea of reusable UI components for composing uh, interfaces. The goal was to make it easy to find and work with the element that you're seeing on the page. So that thing where you navigate to a page on your Drupal site and you're like, God, I wish this button was blue instead of red. I wonder where this is coming from. <laughs> um, and the only way to find out was to clone the site to your laptop, turn on Twig development mode, read all the HTML comments, figure out which template file it was loading, realize that that was associated with some asset library, go find the YAML file that defined the asset library that pointed at the CSS file that you needed to edit to change the color of the button. Uh, not hard, right? Uh, <laughs> One of the things that sort of surprised me when I learned more about um, single directory components, though in the end I, I do kind of like, is that uh, in order to facilitate this goal of making it easy to find and work with, unlike almost everything else in Drupal, there are no hooks. You can't modify. You can't hook into a component and like have one module <coughs> make some changes to it because it needed to alter it in some way. There are no Overrides. You can't override one CSS file from the component, but keep all the rest of it. You know, you think of like theme inheritance in Drupal right now, where it's like, well, I wanted that template file, but the CSS and JavaScript can all continue to live in the, the base theme that I'm inheriting from. Um, there's none of that. Um, and part of me initially was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, that's not how Drupal works. And then later I was like, actually, this is really nice. It's really nice that like, I can go and I can look at the code that is in this single directory component, and I can know that right here is everything that this component is composed of. I'm not worried, I'm like, oh, it's not everything here, plus also some of the CSS from another file elsewhere <laughs> in Drupal. Uh, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, from a very technical perspective on the back end, um, or how this works uh, underneath the hood. Sorry for the sort of not super high quality image here, but um, single directory components are an implementation of Drupal's plugin system. So if you've ever authored a block in Drupal or a menu item or used the plugin, like created a custom plugin, um, it's the same system. Um, and I thought that was really cool because it was a thing, a scenario where instead of inventing something entirely new and, and building it into Drupal, it's like, oh, you know, we have, we already have the plugin system. Components are basically plugins. Let's reuse that system. Um, the other thing that's really cool about this, because it uses the plugin system, as does blocks and fields and field formatters and all the things that we're used to as site builders clicking together in Drupal, it makes it a lot easier for the component system to be integrated into those tools. There is already a lot of code in place in Drupal for that scenario of 
like present the user with a select list where they can choose from one of many plugins. Components are the same thing. Let them choose from one of many components which one they want to use. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then essentially it's a plugin manager that discovers your components, reads in their metadata so that Drupal can know what its human readable name is and what its inputs are, et cetera. Um, and so it's built on top of the existing plugin system with the addition of this Twig loader, uh, it's, which is effectively an extension to Twig so that you can use a Twig include or embed. And instead of having to give it the full path to a file, you can just give it the name of a component and it will go figure out the path to the file for you. Um, and it, you know, initially I was like, oh, this seems really complex. And then I thought, thought well, actually, it's really just like plugins and discovering where they exist, so that's cool. Um, a little bit, so that's kind of the like, kind of high level, what are components? Reusable elements that you can use to compose a user interface. Um, single directory components are Drupal's implementation of that idea. I'm going to next walk through how, as a developer, you can create a new component. Um, for, for Drupal to use, and then also how you can use that component in your theme. Um, so components are d currently defined by modules or themes, um, and they're used within Twig template files or render arrays. And I'm gonna show examples of all of this. So how to define a, a component, uh, my definition example is gonna be ambiguous as to whether it's in a module or theme, it doesn't really matter, it's the same regardless. And then you can use it either from within a template file in a theme, so maybe in your node template file you would like to add a call to action component, um, or as a module developer, you could use a component by creating a render array in your custom block that you're building uh, and specifying that I would like this chunk of HTML to be rendered using the call to action component. Uh, components need to live, the code for your component lives within the components subdirectory of your module or theme. So in the root level of your theme, you would create a components subdirectory, and then all of your components are going to live within that. Each component within its own single directory, um, though those directories can be nested any level deep and organized in any way that you want. You could put all the components just in a top level components directory. So in the, the, this example here, in the, um, that's showing a handful of different components all at the same level. Each of those directories is a representative one. You could also subdivide this directory in any way that makes sense for your project. So maybe you want to use something um, like um, Atomic Design or Pattern Lab or these different ways of organizing your reusable components. Um, Drupal doesn't care how they're organized as long as they're in this components subdirectory. An individual component or a single directory component is a directory somewhere within that component subdirectory with a handful of uh, Drupal specific files in it. The most important one is going to be a uh, metadata file which describes your component. So it'll be name of your component dot component dot YML. Um, so it, uh, I'll have some examples of this, but you've got a metadata file that is YAML that describes the component. Um, you'll have a twig template file that provides the HTML markup for the component. You may or may not have CSS and JavaScript files. Um, these, all the metadata, twig, CSS, and JavaScript files need to follow a very specific naming convention in order for Drupal to find them and, and make use of them. Um, beyond that, you can include additional assets, like if your component needs images or uh, fonts, I guess. What else do we use in the interface? Images and fonts, right? And CSS, that's about it. Um, and you, those things, um, just like in a theme, can kind of be placed anywhere within the directory because we'll point directly to them with the Drupal-specific files. Uh, and they're all going to live in a single directory, hence the name, single directory components. Um, Jeff? Yeah, about fonts. So since they don't inherit um, all of the site's styling, do you have to include the font files in literally every component? You know, I 
Font is probably a bad example in okay. this case. Sorry. You, yeah, because generally you're going to apply your font globally, globally right. to the site. Um, and you probably don't have a design element that has its own unique fonts. Right. If you did, if your call to action was like, had its own unique fonts, you would put those assets okay. with the um, component. But I think generally what you'll see more of is, um, you know, a, a, like a global styles applied still as well for things like typography. Got it. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as an example of what this metadata file looks like, um, it is actually possible to create a component with an empty metadata file. Um, you can just create this file. So the example here would be thing.component.yml. Um, and it, it could be empty. There are some scenarios where PHP doesn't like empty YAML files, so you can't actually really make it empty, but you can just write null in it. However, this is a terrible idea. You should never do this. I don't even know why it's possible. Um, what you should do is provide metadata for your component. Um, if you went blank. Oh. <laughs> um, you should provide metadata for your component. You can do this to varying degrees of sophistication. Um, this would be a very simple example, a name and description and a status. Um, you could imagine this name and the description aren't necessarily used when you're using the component in your twig template file, but you can see how in the future maybe views is like, hey, I wanna know the name of that um, component because I wanna put it in a list that I'm presenting to an administrator to choose from. Um, status. Uh, these are all really well documented, and I'll show you where that documentation is, but status, you can set it to like, this is a stable component or an experimental component, similar to how we can set the status of a module in Drupal core. Uh, and I think it is probably intended to be used as an indicator for like, um, you, this, the rest of this is probably not going to change versus the rest of this might change. Um, you can define a schema for the inputs of your um, component. Um, this lives under the props key. Um, and there are, there are two types of inputs for a component props, uh, which we see here. What you could think of as being inputs to the component where the structure of the data is well known, um, where I know that this input is a Boolean value, like true or false, or I know that this is always just going to be an email address, uh, where I can define uh, a name for the data, but also what that data looks like. Um, so props get a schema that defines the name of the thing that is going to be passed into the component, and then also kind of a definition of what that data looks like. This is done using the JSON schema format. Um, you can you can try to read jsonschema.org. I tried. It was difficult. Uh, I couldn't really figure out anything. Um, but, the, or again, mostly what I did to figure out how these worked was looking at existing examples, uh, and I'll show you some of those. Uh, but JSON schema is a non-Drupal standard that is used for defining uh, data types using JSON. Um, you can also define slots. So props are data that is input into a component where the structure of the data is well known, and you can anticipate what it's going to look like. Slots are for where you have no idea what that data is going to be. Um, typically, this is going to be something like um, the scenario of I want to embed, a, a, allow you to embed another component inside of this component, or like generic HTML is going to be put in here. So imagine a component that is a card, uh, and the card contains content. But what is that content? It's like, I don't know. It might be a string of text. It might be some HTML. It might be a card component, or it might, it might be an image component and a button component and some HTML. So slots are for the scenario where you just don't know what that structure is. Um, and because of that, we can really only kind of define what the name of it is, whether or not it's required, but not uh, requirements about what that data should look like. I will back up for just a second to say that another benefit of properties and being able to define data types is that um, when you use a component, Drupal can validate that use and it can tell you, um, you are passing a non-email address into a property that expects an email address. You might want to fix that. Or 
this button component has a color property, the only values that are possible are primary or secondary, but you said red. That's not going to work. Uh, and so that's kind of a cool thing about this, is that if you, if you do the work of defining what that data type, type looks like, Drupal can validate that it's being used properly. Um, it's stuff, again, it's not required to add your props and slots in their definition, but I think it's a really smart idea to do so. Um, another thing that you can see, you'll see in a component is um, this library overrides property or uh, configuration. Um, a little more on this later, but effectively, like when you create a component, Drupal will take the component's CSS and JavaScript files and automatically create an asset library for you, so you don't have to define that uh, outside of the component itself. Um, however, if it defines it in a way that doesn't work for you, um, you can alter that definition using this library overrides. I think the most common use case for that is going to be something like, my component has JavaScript in it that depends on this other Drupal JavaScript library, like once or jQuery or something like that, and I need to declare that so that when Drupal bundles my asset library, it knows to also include the once library. Uh, and another thing, another advanced one is this ability to define that this component replaces another component. Um, I mentioned earlier that there, one of the things I really like about components is you can't like hook alter a component and you can't override a component. You can, however, entirely replace a component. I think you should think of component replacement more like a fork and less like inheriting something. Um, you are literally like, I'm going to copy and paste this code entirely, that entire directory, into my theme. Um, I'm going to update the YAML file for the component to say this is replacing the one from this other place, and, and forever forward, Drupal will just use that one. Um, I like this, again, because it's still, like all the code for that component is still all just in one place. Uh, I'm not like, some of it's in my theme, some of it's in this base theme, some of it's also in the node module and the system module and this other weird directory. Um, it's all just right here, and that's kind of neat. Um, as of right now, only themes can replace components. So modules and themes can provide components. Um, only themes can replace a component. Uh, I'm not entirely clear on why that is true, um, but it is, so there. <laughs> Um, another thing to know about component replacement is that you can only replace a component that has a defined schema for its properties and slots. So that's another reason why it's a good idea as it, someone creating a component to define that schema so that someone else could replace it. And the reason for that is that you do, um, if you have a button component that takes a, you know, a title and a link and then somebody replaces that component but the new one that's replacing it doesn't take a link, but everything that is using the component assumes it should be able to pass in a link, you're kind of breaking that component's API or the contract. Uh, and so that's why it needs to define a schema in order to be replaced. Um, cool. I want to walk through actually creating an example of a component. Um, and I'm this example comes from the... Um, component quick start guide on Drupal.org. Um, after I attended this session at DrupalCon, I was like, I want to help out and get involved with this. And I was told, you could document how this works. And I was like, all right, fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you tell me how it works, I'll write it down. Um, and um, so my example component is going to be a chip component. Uh, this component allows you to have m super minor inputs. Um, like a chunk of something to display. Um, so that might be an icon and a number. It might be a picture and a name, um, things like this. Um, it'll allow you to choose a color from a color scheme, uh, which color chip you would like to use, and it allows chips to be defined as dismissible, as in you can click the X and it'll disappear. And a chip is intended to be used to like, you know, display a little snack of information on the page and then get rid of it, I guess, when you're done with it. Um, it seems like a really simple example. So, 
Uh, to do that, the first thing I need to do is create a chip. Hmm. That's what we saw <laughs> Try tilting the, po the podium to the left. I don't know. <laughs> Shaking. <laughs> wah, wah. Let's try. There it is. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, okay. The first thing you need to do is define the directory that your component lives in, that single directory, um, and the component.yaml file. Um, the the name here. You don't actually have to name it chip. Like the directory that the component lives in, the name of it doesn't really matter, but it's probably a good idea to just make it match whatever you name this component.yml file. That, so chip.component.yml, I'm creating a new component with the unique name of chip. Uh, that name is important because later on, when it becomes time to use it, um, we need to know its name. Um, so that part of the namespace there is going to be chip. I'll show you how you figure out the rest of it um, when we get to that point. Then you create a schema file for it, uh, or a metadata file. Um, this line up at the top uh, is copy and pasted from the example. Effectively what this does is it can allow your tool, your IDE like PHP Storm or VS Code to uh, understand the schema of this YAML file so that it can auto-complete um, things in the YAML file. Um, and then the, this, basically, you can just copy and paste that line all of the time uh, or use the code generator and it'll just stick it in there for you. Uh, and then you define a name, uh, properties. My chip component has um, two properties, whether or not it's dismissible, which is a Boolean value, and a color, which is a string. Um, it could be one of primary or secondary. Uh, I should really define that further in the schema here and what it would allow you to do is I guess use an enum and say this can be one of these two. Uh, I didn't get that far. I'm saying that color is required. You can't use this component without specifying a color. Dismissible is optional and then there's a slot named chip content uh, which again it's a slot you can put whatever you want into it that's going to be what is in the container itself. So you get a component YAML file that looks like that. And then you need to create a twig template file um, that outputs the markup for your component. So first and foremost, you need to name this the same thing you named your component file. Um, so chip.twig matches chip.component.yml. Uh, that, that part is important. Uh, otherwise, this is a twig file, not unlike any other template file in Drupal. The variables that are input into this twig file are the inputs that I defined in my um, component.yml file. And you can see those being used here. Um, color, dismissible, and the chip content slot. Um, here I've defined it as a block uh, so that, um, which we'll see when we use it embedded in a twig template file, I can put input any arbitrary content into a twig block. Um, these are going to be variables passed into the um, template file. We'll see that in a moment. So you create a twig template file. That's your markup. Uh, you want to add some style to it? Create a chip.css file. Um, the most important thing here, again, being the name. It needs to match the name of your component.yml file. Um, and I think probably a best practice is going to be using something like, um, like uh, BEM block element modifier naming conventions or something like that for components. I think you can come up with in your CSS how you, what makes sense for your project, um, but I think probably something where you're namespacing your CSS properties to the component makes sense. But again, this is just arbitrary CSS. I also was thinking a bit about um, what if I want to use something like SAS to, to write the CSS for my project, or uh, like Webpack or uh, TypeScript or something to deal with my JavaScript. And I, th I think the answer here is, that's fine. As long as it compiles a file named chip.css or chip.js, you should feel free to use that kind of tooling for your project. Just make sure that it's putting these files in the place that Drupal expects to find them. Um, so also, if you want to add JavaScript, you create a file named chip. .js, uh, again, taken from the component name. Um, as long as those all live in the same directory, when it comes time to use your component, Drupal will automatically figure out that there is a JavaScript and a CSS file associated 
with the markup for this component, it'll create the, li the asset library and include it uh, at the time that the component is used. And you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do that part of uh, define an asset library in a YAML file with your CSS over here and your JavaScript over here, and then also tell Drupal in your node template file to load that specific asset library. Uh, it'll do that for you automatically, as long as you follow the naming convention. If you name this like, Dorito.js, uh, it wouldn't get used. Um, in order to use your components, um, you can do that in a couple of different ways. One of them is to use it in a Twig template file. When you are doing so, you reference the component by its name uh, or its ID rather than specifying the path to the component. Uh, and you use standard Twig include or embed uh, syntax. Um, the big difference here would be instead of include path to another Twig template file, it's going to be include name of my component. And the unique name of your component is going to be the name of your module or theme. So for example, if this component was de defined in the Olivero theme, this would be Olivero colon the name of your component. So Olivero colon chip. Um, in your template file, you could then specify that. Well, I used a different example here, but um, the project where I defined it is called SDC underscore examples uh, colon chip. So instead of including a path there, I do that. Um, this is a twig embed syntax. So it's basically saying include another template file in this place, pass these values to the template file. Um, so a color, I set it to primary, dismissible, I set it to true. Um, and then the block in here is the arbitrary content that is being sent into this chip content slot. Um, this is not Drupal specific. You can look at the Twig documentation to learn more about how either embeds or includes work. The only part of this that is Drupal specific is this, this namespacing here. Um, so that's an example of how you would include a component in your node template file. Um, Maybe not a super interesting one at the moment, but I think where this leads to eventually uh, is that our template files, like for a node or for a block, will themselves, instead of having a bunch of twig in them, well, not, instead of having a bunch of markup in them themselves, will likely use components. Uh, right now, when you edit a node template file, you're often doing things like moving fields around and wrapping them with markup so that you can you know, basically style it like a component. Make these three fields combine together to look like a call to action. Make this one over here look like a banner. And I think what we'll see more of in the future, at least initially, is in these node template files, instead of that markup that says, well, here, here's my sign up banner, et cetera, is like embed the sign up banner component. Um, embed the button component. Additionally, you can use components in a render array. Um, this looks like the important part is here. So um, just like you would define a render array in any module to create a, a block or whatever content goes on the page, you'll specify that the element is of a type component, that the name of the component is this unique namespace for the component, and then you specify its props, properties, and slots. Um, properties being, again, sort of like well-defined slots being, well, I don't know, some other renderable thing, I guess. Uh, and I think this is cool because this is how pretty much every module in Drupal defines the content that it's outputting to the page, including things like field formatters. And so you could imagine a scenario where there's a module that discovers all of the existing components for a site and makes them available as formatters for fields. Uh, and that module, all it really needs to all. <laughs> what it needs to do is instead of defining this as like pound type table uh, or you know pound theme table and the markup for a table here, um, it could tell it to use the component and map the values of that field to the properties and slots of the component. In theory, that's all. Um, so that's how you define a component and make use of it. Um, a little bit about what, where I think this is going to lead to next. Um, so first of all, this is still very much a work in progress. Um, 
It is the single director components module or SDC module is was added to Drupal core in Drupal 10.1. So it's super new. You have to be running Drupal 10.1 in order to use this. It's also currently an experimental module, which means you have to be using Drupal 10.1 and you have to have enabled the module for any of this to work. Um, that said, it works when you do that. It works great. I think that one of the things that will happen in the future, um, probably in the not too distant future, is this will become first no longer an experimental module, uh, and then either potentially the module will just be enabled by default, or more likely is the code from the module will just be kind of sprinkled into the rest of core so it's no longer a module and it's just part of how Drupal works. Um, so I think there is a future that is not too far from now in which all of this just works with Drupal installed, but for now you have to enable this SDC module, which I also think means that um, it's only kind of useful at the moment. Like you can't expect that it's going to be available on every project that you work on. Um, that'll change, uh, but for now, um, you have to make sure the module's there and it's enabled. Um, I don't anticipate this format for how components are defined changing much at all. Um, I think that if you author a component following the API today, uh, it will work when this becomes a stable part of core, uh, either with zero or very minimal changes. Probably at most it will be like, sorry, you can't put null in your YAML file. You actually need to fill this out. Um, and so, I, and, and I don't think it's going away. I, I think this is going to become a part of how modules and themes define the markup that they put on the page uh, going into the future. I think one of the next steps is going to be, uh, we'll start to see maybe even before the module becomes a stable part of core, I think this is actually ongoing now, is that the, the work to have modules like all the field formatting modules convert their template files to use components. So the field formatter for a text field that also is, is a long text with summary, um, I anticipate that being a component in the future. Uh, and we're, we're moving in that direction now. Um, another thing I think is useful in trying to figure out where all of this is going is to look at the kind of exploration that is currently happening in contributed modules. I think there's an element of like uh, experimentation happens in contrib and once a good idea is solidified, core will adopt that idea and those things will move towards uh, becoming part of how components are consumed and used in the future. Um, there's a big list here. I'll make sure the slides are available on the, the site so you can click the links. Uh, but some of the things that I saw and played around with a little bit, um, this components Component Libraries Theme Server module. Um, this one allowed me to fairly easily, uh, it's not like turnkey, but fairly easily integrate my Drupal components with Storybook. Uh, so then I could develop them in Storybook and it would, I could edit the CSS and it would hot refresh in Storybook. I could adjust all of the properties and slots in Storybook and see what that looked like. That was pretty cool. Um, SDC generator and um, SDC examples. This one has a bunch of example components. Um, you can look at this for examples of like, what should the YAML file look like? How does any of this work? Does any of this work? Um, this one, actually what I found was install this module and then go install some of these other modules so that you have some components on your site to see what they do. Story generator uh, and this libraries generator. Um, these two are integration with Drush, uh, the Drush generate command to generate um, components, to scaffold a component, uh, and it's pretty smart. It walks through like, hey, do you want to have any props? And you're like, yeah, I do. I want one named color. What values do you want for color? You're like, eh, red, white, and blue, I guess. Um, and stories generator will read your component.yml file and use that to generate a story for integrating with Storybook, which is pretty cool. Um, and then there's a bunch of other modules which I think are moving towards this scenario where components are more tightly integrated into the site building experience. And so modules like Layout Builder, for example, um, you will be able to compose a layout using components. Right now when you compose a layout, you can like insert the field 
into the layout and see its value, and I guess that's good that you can see the value, but what if you want to like, make it a banner or you want to define a call to action? You can't say, like, this node has these three different fields, and I would like you to render them looking like this call to action, and I want this field to be the title and this field to be the link and so forth. You can just put the title and the link and then, I guess, create a template file. Um, to style it. So I think there will be a lot of integration like that. And you can see this happening in... Um, you can't see it happening. You can't see it happening. <laughs> you can imagine this happening <laughs> in uh, the future. Yeah, the future is dark and dreary. <laughs> I don't know. Please. I don't want to like unplug it because then this thing's going to get mad at me. Kevin pushes the button under the TV sometimes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's a, one of something there. I can't tell if they say something or. I turned it off. <laughs> Smooth. All right, well, if it comes back, that's cool. Um, you can imagine this being integrated with other things like. Um, display suite and views, and basically any of those scenarios where Drupal asks you as a site builder, like, what do you want this thing to look like? Uh, and you're like, I guess I just want it output as a string of text is like basically your only option right now. Um, and, and then moving also towards the ability to say, take multiple fields from an entity and combine them together into an output, uh, which I think will be pretty cool. Um, I anticipate that the future also includes um, the development of component library systems. I'm sorry that this isn't turning back on. Um, if you think about like um, Bootstrap or um, the iOS design component library and the ability for someone to install that library and have a whole plethora of components to choose from to compose theirs. Uh, their interface. I think in Drupal, once components are more widely adopted, we'll start to see some of those. And we'll probably start to see some um, that become more popular than others. And then we'll probably start to see every Drupal site look like every other Drupal site. <laughs> um, they're all going to look like Olivero. Um, oh, there we go. Cool. Uh, I think you'll get deeper and tighter. <laughs> we saw <It's> it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> as long as they don't talk about it. <laughs> mm. when, when you look away mm. from it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we'll get like deeper and, and better integration with um, front-end development tooling outside of Drupal. Uh, I've used the example of Storybook so far, um, and this, this is an example of a component being loaded from Drupal into Storybook, and my ability to tweak the inputs to the component and see what that looks like in real time. Um, and I think right now my experience with setting that up was it's possible. Um, it's still a little bit, like there's still some hoops to jump through. I think those types of things will get easier, uh, especially as more people um, start using them. Um, I think that once there are, there's the potential for like once components there are a lot of components defined and they have a well-defined schema from their component.yml file. There's the ability for other tools like Figma or Sketch or all of these design tools to consume that YAML file uh, and be able to present a designer with an interface that contains the component that matches exactly what's going to be used in Drupal, um, as, as is often the case with um, lots of the React component libraries and um, things that I think front-end developers are familiar with already, which is cool. Um, so, yes, it worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, is a quick recap. Um, so, components, I, 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 we can think of components as being reusable elements that we can use to compose a user interface um, or building blocks for your user interface. Um, components are widely used already in the front-end development world. There has for years been an effort, uh, been many efforts to um, implement component type systems in Drupal that have finally landed on this single directory components architecture. Um, the implication is now there is a Drupal 
core standard way to define components, and there are uh, a lot of benefits that come with that. Primarily, it means it opens up the ecosystem so that more people will be using it, uh, and also so that modules that aren't uh, all all modules can expect components to be defined in the same way so that they know how to consume them. So you'll see tighter integration between the idea of components and the modules that allow you to compose a user interface. Uh, and then ultimately, I think this leads hopefully towards seeing uh, component libraries more tightly integrated into these site building tools and the ability for Drupal to finally allow you to create a legitimate landing page. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's right We've got a, a little bit of time left, and I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. So, yeah. I think maybe I was sleeping at the wheel or something. I missed, like, how does the field data get into the component, how, like, when you implement it? Sure. Um, let me pull up a slide quick. And I have a second question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the question was, like, how does field data get into a component when you implement it? Um, right now, if you were to use a component, be, the, you're most likely to do so by using it with an embed or a oh, this isn't the, um, with an embed or an include in a twig template file, and so you would include data from fields on the node, for example, in the component by specifying that here when you call oh, it okay. when you embed it in your template file. So I could instead of just writing primary, maybe I've got a select field on my node content type named color, and it has two values of primary and secondary. And instead of writing primary there, I would say something like, you know, no dot field yeah. underscore cool. color. color. Um, yep. Uh, or for um, sort of uh, user-generated content fields, like HTML or uploaded images or something, you would put the, embed those into a block like this. So this one's actually doing it. Well, kind of. This is the bundle of the node, but maybe it's the body instead. Um, and then in a renderable array, same kind of thing, um, where basically like wherever you're defining this render array, you presumably you've loaded that node entity earlier and you could just say, get the value from the color field on the node entity. And then I think where this lead, where this goes eventually is user interfaces like Layout Builder uh, allowing you to say, hey, embed the component uh, the, the call to action component and Layout Builder would be like, ah, that has the, a need for three inputs. Which fields would you like to yeah. map to those inputs? Um, um, it made me think of the, the Gutenberg project. I was thinking this could somehow kind of combine. This could be really interesting. Yeah, I, I'm not personally fami very familiar with Gutenberg. I, at a high level, I do know that it had, it's sort of like the block based yeah. editor, with, you know, effectively block component like two different names for the same thing. Um, and yeah, I could see this being a very similar type of thing. Yeah. So then the schema that you were talking about wasn't necessarily like where the data is stored, it's just the structure of the file. That's correct. The schema that you define for the inputs for your component are defining not where the data is, but what the data, what it expects the data to look like. Yeah, not where to get the email address, but that it has to be an email address. Steve? Do you have thoughts on how this will shape um, preferences for, for site builders? I feel like this relates to the question you were asking of, of you know, even before components, there was the question of, if I want to change how the field is displaying, do I open up the node uh, template file? Do I find a field format or do I write a field format or <laughs> do I go to Layout Builder? And it, my perception from your presentation is, well, components makes each of those easier. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. Doesn't tell you which one. To doesn't use. tell you which one to use. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm familiar with this problem, yeah. but yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how. I think on the one hand, like, yeah, it means that when it comes to the I want to write the code that says what it should look like, a component is where to do that. Mm -hmm. But then the do I do I integrate the component through a display formatter or through layout builder or through a template file? And it's like, oh, I don't know. 
Um, I don't think this really helps mm. make that less ambiguous. <laughs> Not yet. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Maybe eventually, yeah. like maybe eventually, something like layout builder gets so good that you're mm -hmm. not immediate. Your immediate reaction to a layout builder is like, huh, which template file do I need to overwrite? Yeah, I, like, I, I could imagine that if layout builder integrates with components really well, it that could replace for enough teams the need for like the traditional yeah. field by field, pick your formatter field by field, and just imagine the relationships that this list of fields with yep. this set of formatters is going yep. to have. Or you could, even, you know, maybe Layout Builder gets so good that, uh, or something else, that mm -hmm. like the, the current, you know, manage field display tab is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You don't need to yeah. choose a right. formatter yeah. for every field. You right. just choose what the page looks like. Right, yeah. yeah. And I would, if this goes where I hope it goes, like the thing that all the fields would have in common, I think, would be components. So mm -hmm. I think part of the past problem is that there were, you know, ten different ways that didn't really work very well to create components. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So even having that consistency across the field formatter and layout builder, I think, would help too. Yeah. So the comment is that, you know, one of the sorry to make you sound like that. <laughs> um, one of the benefits of. Um, of this system or having a unified way to define components is that it hopefully gets used more often. It starts to make the possibility of something like Layout Builder superseding display formatters a reality, whereas in the past that's maybe not been true because there, you know, prior to this there were um, n different ways that you could define components depending on which agency you worked for uh, and what they decided was the right way to do it. And now that you, not immediately, but as this becomes more widely adopted, um, there will just be kind of like, well, this is the way you define them in Drupal. Yeah. Guess we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just <Yeah>. kidding. <laughs> no, I'm happy to hang on and continue to answer questions if people have them, though. Um, when you're replacing a component, can you replace one that has a, um, a slot with a prop? So it's like, I want to do a Placement that defines that more explicitly. I don't. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. So the question is, if you are replacing a component and it defines one of its inputs as a slot, which means that the input values are ambiguous, could you, in your replacement, redefine that as being a property where you are explicitly defining what the content looks like? I have no idea. You should try it. And find <laughs> out. Yeah. Seems. Oh, yeah. Possible? Ask ChatGPT. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> ChatGPT will be like, I don't know. That was invented after 2008. Matt. What do you want me to do? It's going to say yes. <laughs> Definitively. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So to, to build on that, the replace thing, are you actually like copying physically, not, not physically, but are you copying in the code into your new component? Or is that replaces just a link to? The yeah. Yep. So, the if you wanted to replace it for it, so the scenario would be, your in your theme you want buttons to look different than the button defined by Drupal's let's say component library, um, and you would copy that component. Basically, you would copy the directory entirely into your theme, uh, and then add that replaces line to the metadata file. And what effectively happens is that when someone tries to embed the component like this, the lookup process looks for this first. Um, it, basically, it would look at all the components and say, oh, hold on a second. I've got one that replaces this. I should use that one instead. Um, but all, you, yeah, you're copying all of the files um, or you know, forking them, basically. Uh, and now your theme owns it. Uh, and hopefully that's less ambiguous than the scenario where it's like, you own the template file, but not the CSS. Um, or not. So, one of yeah. the frustrating things I find with Drupal is not being able to find things. Yeah, I think one of the things that's kind of fascinating about it is like, it kind of goes against a, the sort of standard in Drupal, which is like, well, anyone should be able to do anything with anything at any time. <laughs> and it's like, actually, there's just one way to do it. Like, this is the way you do it, or don't. Um, and, and part of me was initially like, 
You can't do that. That's wrong. And part of me is like, wow, this is going to make it so much easier to teach people where to find the CSS file. <laughs> and that seemed good. So, And I think was one of the ultimate goals that was when uh, everyone that worked on this set out to add single directory components or just add components in general was to kind of alleviate some of that barrier to entry for like, how do you find the CSS file? that's rendering this, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Relatedly, I think on the flip side, maintainability is going to be a lot easier because um, if you change something about that one particular component, you know that what's in that CSS yeah. file is only impacting that particular component. Yeah. Um, and so you won't end up being like, well, I'm just going to leave this block that maybe we don't need anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I, I think maintainability, there's a couple of interesting elements to making it better with components. One of them is that. It's like you, you just know. like every, The stuff in this directory is mine. I should assume that all of it is custom instead of like, eh, what's not. Um, and, and then also there's this, like currently in Drupal with themes, there's this sort of challenge inherent with the, um, the way that you can sub-theme another theme. And um, you're, you know, it's, we have this idea that like you sub theme classy and um, your custom code is just the stuff that you wrote in your theme. But the reality of the situation is like your theme is your custom code and classy. Your theme will not work if anything, in potentially, anything in classy could change and it could break your theme because Drupal doesn't know were you were you inheriting that CSS file or did you override that CSS mm -hmm. file? Like who own who owns this? And so effectively, like if you sub theme something right now, you effectively that's custom code now for your project. Uh, and this kind of alleviates some of that by just essentially saying like, nah, you can't sub theme anymore. You just have to copy the whole thing. Um, so that raises the question: If you use replace and the thing you replace disappears, they deleted it out of the theme that you're replacing. Yeah. Will your components still work? And it's just like, hmm. well, I'm replacing that. I don't see it, but here it is. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, like, <laughs> if the, the base component, the, the thing that you're replacing, the namespace of it disappears, yeah. what happens? I, I don't know. You could read the plugin manager and it would tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what would happen, but I would, like, I would consider that to be like a semantic versioning breakage. Yeah. Like if a, if a contrib module had version 1.0.1 .1 or whatever, and it defined a bunch of uh, components, and then it removed those components, uh, I think I would, I would open an issue saying, hey, you, you don't need to go to 2.x point something because these components are effectively part of the API of your module, mm -hmm. and if you just remove them, okay, that's... You are allowed to do that, but yeah. you should call it a new major version. I think that's probably, yeah, I think that's probably fair. And probably too where like there is a ability to define a status for a component of yeah. being stable or experimental and mm -hmm. so it probably relates somewhat to that and that if you're a module developer and you expose a bunch of components and then you decide either you want to change the schema of it or, or remove it, mm -hmm. you're effectively changing the API. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you should, I guess, communicate that to people. <laughs> yes. But as a contrib developer, you can decide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dan. Um, I had a question. Uh, you were talking about how the module that provides this right now is currently experimental um, in core. Uh, and you said you had an idea of like what you thought might happen. And yeah. My question is, I guess, uh, does experimental mean that like anything could happen still to some extent like yeah you know, so like, you, yep yeah what, a little, i guess the question is kind of like what does it mean that this is ex an experimental module yeah. um what it means for a module to be experimental in core is that um its api or anything about it could change and you should not write code or systems against it under the working with the assumption that nothing is going to change uh, because it could um, eventually as this kinks are worked out um, a module the, the theory is either it will be removed from core or it will transition to being a stable module or and I think in this case it will just be kind of like sprinkled 
into core. Um, so yes, it is possible. It, it is certain that some of this will change. Uh, for example, um, currently they're called single directory components, but you can actually put more than one component in the same directory. Uh, <laughs> there's a patch to make it so like, eh, we should really stick to the name here and only put one component in the directory. Um, and so, so things like that will change. Um, I, but I think the sort of big picture aspects of it, like the, the definition of your component as a YAML file and a Twig file, et cetera, I don't think that's going to change. Um, it, it might. Um, I think probably where most of the changes are going to happen at this point are more kind of like the behind the scenes, like what does Drupal do in the scenario where you're replacing a component and that component got removed? Uh, it's like all these kind of edge cases that are being figured out now. That's kind of what I thought. It's like, yeah. you know, as long as people are using it and getting good, giving good feedback. Like, yep. You know, and yeah, the idea with experimental there, modules is uh, it's a way for people working on core to get projects in front of a wider audience and get feedback on it. Um, historically, something couldn't go into core until it was done, stable. And it was like, how do we know if it's any good if we don't ask people to use it first? And so experimental modules allow core to introduce new features, uh, experiment with it a little bit, let people try it out and use it and build things with it, provide feedback to say, oh, that's weird. Um, <laughs> address that and then ultimately move towards stable. There, I, there, there is an issue on Drupal.org for make SDC stable. So you can kind of see a roadmap of what the maintainers of the code base currently think are the things that need to be ironed out before that'll happen. Um, yeah. yeah, I was just thinking it was maybe worth noting just because I'm like, maybe it could just disappear and be gone. Someday. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I don't think it's Right, bad, I can't, and that's the thing. I can't promise. Because it's marked as experimental, it could go away, but I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. Good. Yeah. So this is it time for another question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so like C CSS question earlier made me think of something. Is that like loaded in a particular order, or is that why you mentioned like the? structure the override. of the CSS classes so that it wouldn't mm. cause, you know, if you had button dot something, you know. Yeah, so the question is about um, effectively like what order do your CSS files get loaded into the DOM because that's important because it's cascading style sheets. Um, and uh, so what you use for naming here isn't going to affect the order that it's loaded at all. More for me, this was just about like, uh, I like having conventions to follow. So I, I, it's like, I'm not going to put a bunch of, I want to make the code that's in this file match the name of the component. For me, it makes it easier to read and maintain. That's not going to affect its order at all. You could, you know, could it, if. I guess the question is more. Yeah, like if you had that. want to put like. Uh, button in here as a class. Yeah. You would want to name it chip dash dash button. Right. One, yeah, you could, you know, so, thanks. Um, <laughs> one of the things you could maybe do is like, you know, if you were worried about namespacing, instead of naming this dot chip, you could name this like Olivero colon chip would be your class name. I guess you can't use colons in class names, but something like that. Namespace it to the project and then the component so that you can be relatively certain that that CSS is going to match up with it. Or you could use like, actually, like whenever a component's embedded in the page, Drupal adds a data selector to it, so you could use that selector. Um, the other thing is um, the way that Drupal determines the order that files should get loaded is um, by the asset library, and this is going to create that automatically, presumably. So, if, are you familiar with defining asset libraries in a theme? Um, you write some YAML for your CSS because it's Drupal. Um, you write some YAML that says like include this file and include them in this order, and it groups it together using uh, Smacks scalable and modular architecture for CSS uh, naming conventions. And one of the, one of the... Oh, is that like theme and... Yeah, yeah, theme, and one of them is component. And I bet 
this puts the component ones in the one named component, but if you wanted to change that, you could use this override. And the thing you would do is move your CSS file either to a different um, grouping, or you can add a, one of the properties you can put here is weight. So you could say like weight negative 100 or 100, if for some reason you needed to change that ordering. Yeah. My sense is that's probably pretty rare that you would need to do it, but. I just don't rely on it. Totally. <laughs> just, just add important <laughs> exclamation point. <and> <laughs> to everything. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn this off.